Good. Uh, we are live now, everyone. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much uh, for joining uh, Horasis Asia Meeting 2021 in the plenary panel of enumerating the risk of supply and demand for energy. Uh, so, we have uh, uh, four uh, speakers uh, joining our panel, uh, chaired by myself. Uh, so, in the next 45 minutes, we will discuss uh, the topic of how we able to see uh, the risk of supply and demand for energy. And uh, I will be the chair. Uh, my name is Ivan from, uh, I'm the director of AWI Group. We have uh, 12 years of experience in the uh, renewable energy and environmental related business. And I'm very uh, honored uh, to be joined by uh, speakers from all over the world uh, today. Uh, so good morning, good evening, and, and good day to everyone. So we have in here uh, Camille uh, from uh, 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 Howden, joining from uh, Singapore, and uh, we have uh, Rajiv uh, uh, from uh, uh, the field delivery, joining from India, and we have uh, Srikant uh, Frankat Raman from Energy Consulting Practice, joining from uh, Washington DC, USA, and we have in here uh, Pranav uh, uh, Banach from uh, Petrokas Lubricant, uh, joining from uh, India. Uh, so. Uh, before we start uh, to hear from the speakers, uh, please allow me to say a few words uh, uh, for the direction of our discussion today. So as what we know, uh, COP26 have finished and we could understand that even though if we do things according to what has agreed in COP26, then we still only reach a maximum 1.8 degrees rather than 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius. And for example, the country where I'm living right now and also my nationality, which is Indonesia, uh, according to the government data, there's a, there, about 52 million people will lose their place to live and work uh, due to drowning uh, because most of our population live in the coastal area. And I believe this also goes to the audience in here uh, uh, as exposed to this risk of the uh, increase of the sea level because of the climate change. So as we know that as Asian nations develop their industry and individuals demand more electrical power, uh, and uh, we also ought to meet with the UN SDGs and climate change goals, but where should be the balance? Who will bear the brunt of many changes? Because as we know that there's an issue about the affordability, but we need to also uh, considering uh, the impact of climate change. So it's not an easy situation that we are living now. Uh, so I, I uh, and so, Will anyone be brave enough or be permitted to publish an honest evaluation of the cost and probable effects of meeting or missing the goals? So uh, we will try to conduct this discussion today by uh, giving the first opportunity uh, for the speakers to uh, uh, in, uh, reintroduce uh, themselves in brief. And also, uh, I will try to help to direct some questions for the discussion. And then the, we will try to pick up some uh, interesting points from the initial round so that we can have sort of a free discussion in the second round. And uh, if uh, there is an audience that would like to discuss or to take part, maybe we can also uh, get uh, take some opportunity if time allows, and then we will uh, close the discussion uh, uh, before the five minute, 45 minutes time ends. So perhaps I would like to uh, give the first opportunity to uh, Camille, uh, ladies first. <laughs> So she's the president of Asia Pacific for Howden in Singapore. So I guess uh, the first questions that we'll, I would like to deliver to you is, where should be the balance uh, between the hunger for energy and our need to grow? And who do you think uh, should you know, uh, really uh, bear the responsibility uh, and uh, take the role uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to be actively in, uh, in these uh, changes? You know? what, roles, what roles that needs to be played by the different stakeholders and how do you think the role of technology can help energy transition where I think Howden have a lot of experience uh, in this regard. So first, I would like to give the opportunity to Camille. So over to you, Camille, from Singapore. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Ivan. So my name is uh, Camille Levy. I, uh, I run uh, Asia Pacific for Howden. I'm the, I'm the president of the Asia Pacific region. Uh, prior to joining Howden, I've spent uh, 15 years with uh, General Electric, uh, primarily in the energy sector, uh, working in uh, power generation, so mostly uh, coal power plants, nuclear power plants, uh, globally and most uh, most recently for the past uh, for the past many years, uh, covering uh, China, Asia Pacific, and, and India. And um, I guess if you're really you spend some time in the energy business, uh, Howden is a world leader in air and gas handling. So we provide um, equipment 
across a wide variety of, of, of sectors and primarily in the energy sector looking into power generation, oil and gas, uh, mobility. And, and really, I think what you face in Asia in the past 20 years is a huge, huge, to your word, uh, Ivan, is a huge hunger for growth. I think in, in very simple terms, you were thinking, and again, numbers defer, but 1% GDP growth typically translates into 0.8% growth in electricity demand. And as you're looking post COP26, I think really what we're all trying to resolve is what I call the energy conundrum, which is really looking at how to balance growth, which is GDP growth, the environment, and security of supply. And this topic of security of supply, I think is something that has come very, very abruptly to a lot of us during COVID when borders were shutting down. But if you've been in the energy sector for a long time, you know there's been a long history of government utilities which have not managed to solve the energy conundrum in the right way. And when you're looking at very developed countries which have had very ambitious energy transition policies, Take Germany, where you were seeing very ambitious renewable energy policy, shifting away from nuclear, but you had having situations of, of blackout. And in the long term, the electricity, the uh, CO2 intensity and the electricity generation is actually increased in the past year because obviously you're looking at developing a large number of intermittent, um, intermittent power generation sources. Look more recently at what's happened in China with power shortages. And then you realize that trying to balance the hunger for growth with energy security and environment is really something extremely difficult. I think the most difficult piece is trying to understand who will bear the cost. Because in reality, if you're a government trying to solve the energy conundrum, you're thinking, hey, in the end, do I want the consumers to bear the cost? And how do I make sure that the increase in electricity prices uh, is not going to affect the end customer and the ability to grow industry? Take Australia, for example. Australia used to be a country where electricity prices, because of the very large availability of resources, was very cheap. And in the past 15 years, a lot of coal plants have been shut down, which obviously is very beneficial for the environment. But you're looking at electricity prices which are now amongst the most expensive within the, within, uh, within developed countries. So now let's really look at, we know that consumers are going to be bearing the cost in the long term. Yes, governments want to favor the energy transition, but I think that's where technology comes in. And I think technology needs to come with the right level of pragmatism, which is recognizing that there is a deliberate pace for the energy transition. And I think out of COP26, this debate of, Phase down versus phase out is really showing how very concretely governments like India, like Indonesia, like the Philippines have been trying to strike the right balance. Yes, of course, net zero is the direction, but I need to afford to have affordable energy prices and I need to ensure that I have energy security. So I think Howden is a good example of technology companies. Historically, we've been very present in the power generation sector, providing a lot of heaters and fans uh, for very large number of power plants in the region. What we're looking at doing now is really bringing the latest generation of technology, recognizing you have an install base. This is addressing the need of energy security and affordability. But how do you find the right technologies and the right incentives coming from the government, coming from electricity prices, coming from carbon prices, to make sure that you can drive the latest generation of technology, say, replace a given equipment by higher efficiency equipment, we can do this with fan and heater, or take and refineries taking the latest generation of compressors, or also repurposing some of the equipments. We've been working extensively with, with Shell in the Netherlands at looking at repositioning some of their refineries, which are typically using fossil fuels to now be using uh, biofuels. So trying to produce up to 320,000 tons of biofuels in a given year, leveraging existing installation and shifting. So I think really, the to, to answer your question, I think really trying to find the right balance and the right pace to solve the topic of growth, 
energy security and environment, obviously something that government and companies need to partner. I think technology for sure will be a, a great part of the solution. And I think ensuring that the investments are going to new technologies, but also ensuring that existing technologies are being deployed um, because a lot of these already exist. Thank you very much, Camille. I think you are really uh, addressing some very important points about how the technological role can really uh, sort of, uh, you know, becoming the, uh, you know, a key uh, uh, factor when it comes to how we can, uh, you know, mit mitigate the risk uh, or managing the risk of supply and demand for energy and make sure, making sure that we, have, we do have the right technology to, you know, uh, to move forward with this climate uh, crisis. So I would like to move over to, uh, and I, first of all, I'd like to welcome Scott Mekin from Dylan Capital. Welcome and thank, and nice to see you able to join. Uh, uh, so really happy to have you here. So uh, I would like to move over to uh, uh, Pranav uh, so, uh, uh, from uh, Petronas uh, Lubricant. So the question over to Pranav is, uh, I would like to know, like India is a power hungry nation, right? And uh, one vocal about facing down rather than out. So how do you, uh, what is your take on this and how does, how, how it can be different from China uh, regarding the position, for example, related to coal? Uh, maybe you have some, uh, your own point of view about this and especially, you know, you yourself come from the oil industry. So how should you think India should make the energy transition also to accommodating the affordability and maybe, uh, yeah, would like to hear more uh, on that from you. Uh, so over to you, Pranav. Sure, sure. Uh, thank you. And uh it's good to be back on this panel. Good to see some familiar faces. Uh, it was a good good opening from Kami. I think she's, she's touched upon some interesting conundrum. Uh, but I'll, I'll just give a quick perspective. I think from a developing country, uh, the narrative that the developing countries are making, and India being one of them, uh, to the developed world is saying that, you know, you had your way, you pumped in all the CO2 into the system. Now, when we are looking at growth, you know, all these things are coming in. So this narrative, although sounds very sort of, you know, simple, childish, uh, but these are the, is a real challenge for the leadership and the, the political leadership to manage their constituents with this narrative. I think externally they can sort of challenge rationally, but when it comes to internal management of this narrative, it's very, very hard. And that's the fear that not only the Prime Minister from India, but also maybe President Jokowi, all, all these uh, guys are you know, facing. Uh, so how is India looking at all these numbers, right? So the stats are all out there, but when India looks at the numbers, they look at the following stats. So I wanted to share something. I think first they say that China and USA contribute to about 43% of the total emissions. Uh, EU, about 21%. Okay, India, less than about 7%. So, you know, the bulk of the problem from an India lens is actually with the China, US and the EU. And if if world wants to get to its targets, even if India does miracles, you're going to only impact a small portion of the pie. So that's the that's the kind of uh, uh, kind of stats, the way they look at stats. I mean, statistics is statistics. You know, it always depends on who is viewing it and how. Another interesting uh, paradigm that they bring in is per capita. So, you know, India's per capita carbon uh, CO2 emission is 1.91 as opposed to Canada, which is like the, you know, epitome of uh, everything that is right and how humans should live is about 90, which is highest in the OECD world. So uh, these kind of stats put up put up a very different uh, challenge for India. And I think Kami, Kami touched it on this. Is she's like, how do you balance the growth versus the energy demand. So, you know, India's put out an ambition ambition of creating a 5 trillion economy by 2025. And if you just look at the simple stats, the energy consumption would double from where we are today. So 20, 2020 to 2030, the double, uh, the double the amount of energy would be required. Now, in this context, I think uh, I, the Indian government has made very bold uh, statements and ambitions at the COP26. And I think some of the panelists who were there would be able to sort of recall this, that, you know, it will reduce the carbon intensity by 45 percent. They're looking at reduction of one billion uh, ton of CO2 reduction in 2020 by 2030. And the renewables uh, energy generation and 
would be almost about 50% of the total energy demand in 2030. So under this context, under the internal sort of narrative, I think the government has gone out there and put up a very bold stake saying that, you know, we can do this. And just to put a little perspective on China, I know you asked me, I think uh, there are interesting stats available that the China state companies, if you look at the emission of some of these state companies like the China Steel or Sinopec on oil and gas, they are larger. The, the single company emissions are bigger than some of the economies so as, as size of Australia, Mexico, others. So the scale at which China is operating and uh, where it is, is extremely different from a India lens. And that's the scale makes a lot of difference. I think even if they move a little at that scale, it'll break, create a lot of stuff. But in India, if you, it'll not move the needle by even doing uh, like bending all over backwards. So coming to the conclusion of my point was that where you asked, you know, how do we go about this ambitious growth target and uh, not polluting further? Uh, there are there are four. Uh, I would say there are four areas that uh, you know the government is looking at, and I understand that I think India is still energy poor. So the 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 distribution of this energy to all the classes of people is not uh, not it's not equal. I think the India's rich actually pollute seven times more than the India's poor. So even within India, there is a lot of distortion in terms of who is putting more carbon out of the system. So under these circumstances, you know, my opinion is that there are four elements on which the, the, the policymakers will have to go on. So number one is policy and the intent. I think that is pretty much clear. But you got to understand it from a political scenario because the current ruling party has a very strong mandate. So if the mandate shifts in the next two years, uh, which I think my other friends would be able to tell us more, I think we will get into all sorts of uh, trickery because you'll not be able to push this agenda until you have a good, strong local mandate. Uh, second, I think Kami uh, talked about is, is technology and people. I think how do you how do you reduce dependence on coal? We are saying we'll use only about 50% of the coal for energy consumption. Uh, that requires a lot of technology and people, uh, which currently the ecosystem may not have. And that along with the vaccine uh, equanimity, which we were discussing earlier, I think the technology disparity also exists. Yeah. I mean, some of the guys have the technology, whereas some countries don't. The third is efficiency. I think I'd love, love to hear views on this because there's a lot of wastage of power. There's a lot of wastage of uh, the demand management is not really nice. Supply efficiencies, inefficiencies are a glory. And last but not the least, I think maybe we can get Scott later on this is you know, the climate finance. I mean, simple numbers that say that India would require $1 trillion in order to achieve any of these goals that have been stated. Uh, so where is this money going to come from? Are we going to print it? Or are others going to print it and pump it? Those are larger questions. And coming back to what happened in Paris, I don't think the financial goals were honestly met by the countries who have been in the position. As opposed to COVID, I think they were able to print a lot of money and get the countries out of the spiral. So uh, these are the four elements, I think, uh, which would be crucial as we go along this journey. Uh, uh, back to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Pranav. I think you really set out the hard realities, especially facing by the developing countries like India. Uh, uh, and and it's, not an, it's not an easy situation to be addressed uh, when it comes to what are the things need to be uh, uh, done when it comes to you know uh, facing the risk of supply demand for energy uh, related to the climate change. So I, I guess I, I would like to try to move over to uh, 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 Sri uh, Kant, if if I if I may. Uh, so I would like to know more uh, from your own experience because as we know, uh, you as what we discussed uh, before that you actually went to the COP twenty six. And well, uh, since we all heard about the technology point of view from Camille and also about the realities of a developing country uh, mm -hmm. like in India, and actually you, you also yourself uh, uh, also uh, from India. So how do you see situation, uh, especially, you know, you come to COP26 and how do you see the situation from over there? What are the recent trends about how we can reduce our carbon footprint for energy supply affordably? 
uh, what kind of commitments that actually have been stated specifically uh, to help these developing countries uh, and to make this transition? Or can we actually print money as what Pranav said and, you know, we can solve this problem just like that? Or, or, or yeah, please share more about your experience uh, also <coughs> from your participation in SOP26. Over to you, Srikant from Washington. Uh, thank you, Ivan. Uh, yeah, and great insights from Kamili and Pranav. Um, and difficult act for me to follow, but I'll try my best. Uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, I lead the energy and uh, sustainability practice at the Digital Economist. And I, <clears throat> I also wear another hat. I'm also a senior advisor uh, to the US Department of Defense on energy resilience issues. Uh, I was there at COP26, and I think uh, the biggest thing that came out of COP26 is basically two. Uh, there are two things. And I think I will touch on the more critical aspect first the finance aspect. The commitment of countries, uh, the, the Paris Accord said that the developed countries would commit $100 billion annually to help the developing countries uh, you know, meet their climate uh, commitments you know, with the technology transfer, but we all know that hasn't happened. And uh, until now, it's just about $79 billion have been uh, spent by the developed countries on developing countries. Uh, COP26 was disappointing from that perspective because what uh, they said was they will just uh, follow up with the developed countries on whether they will meet the 100 billion uh, target annually that has been set for them. So, uh, you know, it was it was a very weak wrap, wrap on the knuckles, so to say, on the developed countries. But, uh, you know, uh, at COP26, uh, you know, I just want to focus on a slightly different concept. Uh, we actually did a study uh, and we presented this at COP26 and uh, one of our findings was actually uh, picked up by the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in a speech at COP26. So basically what uh, the, the challenge with, uh, you know, the challenge with the carbon tax so is, it's you know, it's a consumption based tax and its effectiveness to some extent has been neutralized. By various other tax rebates that you know consumers get, so uh, I'm not sure how much burden is actually being borne by the consumers because you know every political party in every country is dictated by its internal uh, you know dynamics and everybody wants to win elections. So you know the yes, there's cons consumption tax, but money always is given back to the consumers in some form or other. So what we advocated for is. Uh, severance tax, uh, which is which is more production based. And uh, this concept of severance tax is not new. In fact, as early as uh, this year, uh, earlier this year, uh, severance tax was proposed by uh, the Pennsylvania governor on natural gas. And uh, expectedly, he met with a lot of backlash. So uh, what we are saying is this production tax is the tax should be levied at source. The movement, the non-renewable uh, resource is severe from the nature. And in our analysis, uh, what we are what we found was it's a, a three dollar per barrel of oil equivalent tax will fetch two and a half times the Paris Accord uh, targets. So it'll fetch about two hundred fifty two hundred fifty billion dollars in revenue. Right. So now if you compare this production, this proposed production tax uh, with the consumption tax, with the U.S. consumption tax, uh, it's equivalent to about $60 of uh, per ton of uh, U.S. consumption tax. Uh, it's equivalent to about $50 per ton of European, uh, 50 euros per ton of uh, European uh, consumption tax. So you can see that uh, in, in terms of the impact on the consumers, the production tax is just equivalent to about seven and a half to nine dollars per ton of carbon tax. So you can see the impact of the production tax in terms of the revenues is two and a half times more, but in terms of the financial burden on the consumers, it is much lesser. Now the challenge is, uh, you know, with the implementation of this tax, the hope that there was global corporate tax, you know, that was signed on between 135 countries offers hope that one day we may see a global carbon tax, you know, which is production based. But there are a lot of, you know, the, the, I mean, a lot of, if, if the world is going to go down that path, there are a lot of issues to be thrashed out, 
in terms of the emissions coverage, how do we, how do different countries rationalize that with the existing fuel taxes? And you know, what countries are going to be levied what tax? Is it going to be a uniform tax for all countries? Or is it going to be a multi-tier tax? So uh, uh, IMF actually earlier uh, this year, they came out with a similar concept, although that concept was still a consumption tax. But they essentially said that there should be a three-tiered carbon tax uh, essentially levied on the major polluters or the major emitters. Uh, and they bucketed them into India and China, uh, Europe, and the U.S. And uh, they have advocated for a $5 per ton of carbon tax for India and China, uh, $25 for, per ton for Europe, and uh, sorry, the third one is not the U.S., the third one is Africa. It's, and they said $75 per ton for Africa. So uh, I think uh, the world the world needs to look at innovative ways of uh, you know, really mitigating this uh, carbon uh, climate challenge. And you know there has been a lot of debate about you know contacts and how effective they are. But we need the world needs a more unified approach uh, in addressing this challenge. And uh, we need some out-of-box solutions. The other major thing that was discussed at uh, COP26 was uh, the whole. there is a disparity between uh, the climate targets that have been set by different countries. I mean, this COP26, we saw about 151 countries summiting their climate targets, right? Now, if you talk about the net zero goal, and that is the new buzzword, you know, everybody is talking about net zero goal. And, you know, with the change, I mean, with the change in the administration in the U.S., even the U.S. Department of Defense, which primarily focused on energy resiliency, today is talking about climate resiliency, and they're looking at having their own net zero goals. But you know, then if the countries meet their net zero goals, we will badly manage to meet the target of one point five degrees or one point five degrees, right? And, but if we, on the other hand, in the current trend of the national nationally determined climate change targets, if we are if we go continue to go on that path, the climate change would, uh, target would not be achieved. In fact, the climate ch- increase in temperature would be about two point five degrees. And I think uh, it's important that this that there is a certain credible credibility gap between uh, the indices and the net zero targets. And I think that 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 gap needs to be. Uh, addressed. Uh, let's see. Uh, I mean, many countries are expected to submit their NDCs by end of 2022, uh, and we will know, you know, what direction we are headed in then. But uh, I, th- I think at this point in time, if you ask me, the COP26 has managed to keep the hope alive, but just about barely. Uh, in terms right. of uh, the sectoral focus, uh, I think we are, you know. Everybody has been focusing on the electric sector for the last two, three decades, you know, on the building sector. But with the transportation sector, is you know, it's getting the atten- attention that it should. We all know that today, transportation sector is the highest emitter of carbon. It has exceeded the electricity se- sector. Uh, it has overtaken the electricity sector. And uh, at the COP26, there was a lot of focus on um, hydrogen as a transportation fuel. Right. And I think that's going to be the next big thing. And this is people call, calling it the second coming of hydrogen, right? And it is just not green hydrogen. It is just old, plain, traditional hydrogen, mm-hmm. right? So it's, you know, and, right. and, then, and then you have uh, green hydrogen. And the reason why uh, hydrogen is going to be so important because it's going to be critical to the future of electric vehicles as well. I think, uh, you know, uh, and specifically, you know, more than the compressed natural, uh, I mean, the compressed hydrogen, it's going to be the liquefied hydrogen that holds, that's going to hold greater promise for for, right. for, for the transportation fuel. And, you know, you know people, people talk about electric vehicles, people talk about you know, reducing emissions from private or personal fleet, but uh, people don't realize the bigger challenge is the freight traffic. I think uh, the, the heavy duty traffic, the freight traffic, they account for about 14 to 15% of emissions from the transport sector. 
Right. And I, and I think, uh, you know, going forward, I think that's where a lot of the attention is going to be on hydrogen, on transportation sector and specifically on hydrogen. All right. Thank you very much, Rikan. I think uh, you play your act really well, <laughs> especially with the time, the given time zone that you are now. So really appreciate on that. Uh, so before we coming back to the realities that we're facing in India, uh, which is uh, coming to Rajiv, I would like to go first to Scott, perhaps. Uh, uh, I think we discuss about some, uh, you know, uh, uh, there are some mechanisms that maybe uh, now in discussion about how we can really uh, increase the effort uh, to make this energy transition effective in developing countries. Uh, but maybe since you are coming from the uh, 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 private, uh, you coming from the capital or from the investment point of view, I just want to know, like, what what do you think uh, the the things that can drive investment in this energy transition? And what can be successful and why? Maybe you can share more about your experience and, and, and maybe you can also share your views about uh, hydrogen, uh, which mentioned by Srikan just now, because is it is it too early for us to do serious from now or what can be done from now or how should we see hydrogen from the investment point of view? So over to you, uh, Scott. Thank you. Yeah, that's a that's a truckload of things to address uh but i'll i'll do my i'll do my best and, and try to bring simplicity to it which is of course going to be incorrect because this is anything but a simple uh issue um let me start with the uh, concept and, and Srikant sort of went this before so the difference between one and a half degrees and two degrees when asked the president of the maldives said the survival of the maldives so <clears throat> you know we're already at 1.1 or 1.2 degrees uh, above the pre-industrial. And so, and what, you know, just to pick one uh, stat, uh, what one, once was a 50 year high temperature event <clears throat> is now happening under 10, uh, once every 10 years. And uh, if we get to one and a half times, that'll be still down to about six times. If we get two degrees, it'll be four times. And if we stay on the course that were, uh, as just mentioned, especially Conf, that'll be about once every one year. Um, that's just one of the other types. <clears throat> what what is kind of a, an, an answer here, and it's because we're being forced into it, but not a complete answer, and and uh, one with pitfalls is is that um, <clears throat> as you correlate, and people have correlated man-made CO two emissions to high temperatures. Right? That's one of the things that I, the IPCC did this year. Uh, and that's not surprising. But the other thing that correlates is insured weather-related claims. And they correlate pretty well. And so these last few years have had massive, massive insured weather claims, and they're continuing to come. And an <clears throat> partial answer to Pranav's question about where the money is coming. Well, you have already have trillion, tens of, and tens of trillions of, of dollars, assets under management, AUM, that have signed pledges to put money to use to help change the energy transition. So, you, And this is coming from insurance companies, pension plans, and other people who see what this is going to impact, this is going to have on their on their portfolios. <clears throat> and obviously, you've had a shift in the ownership of oil and gas to people who were dividend driven to people who are more opportunistic in terms of what they're doing. And you've had the exodus there. And what that means is that you're going to have a lot of perturbations. Um, <clears throat> so that's all well and good. But let's not, you know, sort of forget that coming out of COP26, many of the developed nations have said they're no longer going to fund uh, fossil fire development in the developing nations. Um, and what that means is if you believe, as I do, that gas and, and to some extent liquid fuels are your transitory fuel to, to bridge the gap of messiness, and there's a huge gap of messiness that's going to happen over these next 10, 20 years uh, before other technologies uh, take root here, <clears throat> um, well, you're in essence, in a sense of a more uh, environmental or an economic racism that's happening, uh, whereas the, the very privileged countries can continue, continue on. U.S. and Europe are using uh, you know, more coal. U.K. has been using coal uh, because they don't want to you know, sort of stomach the gas pricing and, and you know, other <clears throat> geopolitical impacts like Russia and lot. So that is, that is going to be quite difficult, I think, for countries like India. So if you if you if you sort of pull back, you know, medium to long term, there will be a lot of solutions for all of this. There are technologies that are going to displace fossil fire fuel uh, across electrification and transport uh, that will be there. So, and I do think hydrogen 
is uh, particularly, as mentioned, for the heavy the heavy transit, so the freight transit, airlines, shipping, things like that. I think I do think that uh, hydrogen will, will certainly be one of them. But there are also technologies that can replace industrial heat uh, sourced from fossil fuel to renewable. And that is what has to happen because um, for us to get to 1.5 or even 1.7 degrees, we are going to have to take the amount of electricity that we are generating around the world today and, and by 2050, multiply that by four and a half times. And that's not just to take into account under electrified countries. That's to take into account getting us off of fossil fuel and replacing that with things that can be electrified with renewables. But in between that, and this is where I think the rubber meets the road in this sort of conversation is in between that, I would say, don't let perfection be the enemy of the good. And what does that mean? You have to acknowledge that gas and to some extent liquid fuels are transit, trans, transition fuels. And where it is ever possible, you have to, first of all, in the developed nations, enough is enough relative to coal. Um, that, and, and I'm counting China that who continues to, to build up coal-fired projects. It's, it's, it's absolute disgrace. Yes, they got all this press that they're not going to fund them overseas. They're still funding them like crazy, you know, right there in China today when they do have access to gas. And my main point is you have to put the policies, procedures, and infrastructure in place to recognize in this transition period, for whether it's 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it is in your locale, that you're going to have to have some gas. That will help you get to, um, to net zero by 2050. That's an enabling device. And, and along the way, uh, one of my partners at Denim has spoken to a guy, a very senior guy who just retired from Mitsubishi Power Industries. What he said is across the blocks in their, in their uh, combined cycle gas turbines, with one exception, every single CCGT that they're working on has the ability to do gas and hydrogen. All right. So this is another example of where companies are going to be here in front of politics. I'm, I'm reminded, I'm sorry, it's a very brief joke. The joke of the politician sitting there being uh, interviewed by a journalist and his feet up on his desk and expounding about this and that. And he looks out the window and he sees a group of people who are obviously protesting. They've got signs. He can't figure out what they're doing. He says to the journalist, listen, I have to stop this interview. I have to see where those people are going so I can lead them. And I think to some extent that's where we're going to be. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Scott, for you know trying to see it in a more uh, realistic uh, and pragmatic point of view about uh, talking about the transitioning fuel and all that. And speaking about transitioning fuel, we're moving to uh, India again, uh, uh, back uh, with uh, uh, Rajiv, Dr. Rajiv from Fuel Delivery. So, you know, speaking about liquid fuel, so you're do, doing something about liquid fuel. You are involving in this fuel market, which is actually just standardizing. And now we have to make the energy transition. So, how do you think? Uh, needs to be done. Uh, what do you think is something that needs to be done? Is it possible to utilize the current system for diesel, for the non-fossil fuel, like we're talking about hydrogen before? So how you can utilize the knowledge that you have right now so that we can make this energy transition to move forward, especially with the realities in India. So over to you, Dr. Rajiv. Thank you, Ivan, and um, thank you to all my colleagues for deliberating very interesting points. I would, uh, you know, very interesting to speak on the subject from one of the most polluted city in the world. So New Delhi has been the most polluted city in the world, one of the most polluted, polluted city in the world. I, you know, when we are talking about this subject and I am into the business of the fuel delivery, the diesel delivery at the doorstep, the irony is that, you know, uh, the schools opened in New Delhi after so many months in, you know, beginning of this month. And they were, they were closed they were closed again after a week just because the pollution level was severe in New Delhi. The government has only decided to reopen the school because the pollution level from severe has come to very poor. The schools are being opened. So who would, you know, I think who better than people living in, in New Delhi would want to to have a clearer air and the best time i think i remember we had the best air to breathe in india was during the lockdown time when there were no vehicles there was no work there so having said that uh you know of course we are talking about shifting from the fossil fuel to the newer energy uh, resources 
hydropower, nuclear, other renewables, and and of course India is working towards that. But the diesel that is required, uh, you know, today in the country for not only vehicles but a lot of equipment which runs the businesses, diesel generator sets, the construction equipment, the earth moving equipment, warehousing equipment, mining equipment, etc. The market size of diesel is 90 billion liters. That's the size of the diesel which is either being procured from the retail outlets or being delivered at the doorstep. Now, having said so, uh, the fuel delivery our organizations and few others only started doing the delivery of diesel at the doorstep last year. The government of India decided that last mile diesel delivery has been an issue, which is required for many coming years to run the business in various aspects. So one side government has just initiated this uh, 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 this scheme for for the people like us. They are calling us fuel and fuel entrepreneurs to deliver the diesel. And on the other hand, we are talking about how to you know get out of using all these uh, fossil fuel. However, very interestingly, to generate electricity, we are using about 60, 62 percent of fossil fuel as on date and only three percent of oil. So diesel, uh, as Scott says, that, you know, the transportation has a lot of uh, consumption of, of, of diesel. Now, this is the this is the facts on, on grounds. However, uh, on the other hand, we as a, as a country, as as the business community is also trying how to use um, uh, an alternate route, how to take alternate measure to actually actually cover the last mile delivery of even CNG, the last mile delivery of even EVs. So organizations like us are actually working on that. Uh, uh, Gale India, which is Gas Authority of India Limited, which is, uh, you know, which, which, which is a which is an India um, uh, Indian organization for production of uh, CNG is actually coming up with these options of uh, of allotting areas regions to different organizations for MRUs mobile refilling units and two of the pilot projects have been successful let's see how soon it can happen right. portability right. of uh, 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 the batteries that's also an option that you know, people are working on. Of course, we have various electric charging stations uh, to cater to uh, electric vehicles. That, that's happening on the road. But I think last time when we were talking, Yvonne, and I was telling you that when you travel in the cities today where CNG or EV um, refilling stations are do exist in, in few of uh, uh, in the cities in India, we see nobody, you know, actually nobody on the EV stations and long queues on the uh, CNG stations and you know decent amount of people sit uh, uh, waiting in the in the diesel and the petrol uh, station. So right. far from far from reality, you know the situation is. I don't think you know if if we actually have to do away with the fossil fuel completely, even in transport. I think we are about ten to fifteen years, uh, you know, away by actually doing it. That may happen in the cities, you know, that may happen in the cities now. But as, as we speak, there are diesel vehicles which are sold and they can run in the cities for 10 years. Right. So if somebody is buying a vehicle today, the 10 years, the diesel has to be made available uh, to run. And, and and talking about tier two, tier three cities in India, I think um, that's going to take another 15 years. So, so that's the that's the reality on ground. I mean, right. um, uh, with, with uh, you know, with all consideration to the climate change and the environment uh, it, it looks it looks that doorstep delivery of diesel doorstep delivery of another form of energy is going to stay for a, for a for a long time right another important aspect i think i'll just touch upon before i i give it back to you uh, ivan to uh, take it forward we were talking about the finance aspect so so petroleum products and alcohol are the only two products in india which are which do not cover the general sales tax, uh, which is which is you know it, all, everything else is being covered under, right. and there have been various uh, discussions, rounds of meeting happening that why can't petrol, diesel, aviation fuel, etc. should come under uh, GST and not the other tax. So I, I I think 
right even even if the gst is removed from uh, this diesel which is which i just said is a 90 billion market i think the loss that government is going to make is 300 and million 300 million dollars that would be the loss if these taxes are uh, removed from uh, right. from the diesel so these are some some of the facts on ground and i'm i'm you know all my colleagues were talking uh, you know of course uh, a larger view but this is this is the fact in one of the uh, largest countries supporting um, you know uh, uh, use of use of new forms of energy right Ivan. okay uh, thank you very much and i'm sorry we're actually running out of time and i also have to jump to my plenary meeting because i'm also moderating there but nevertheless i think we really touch upon a very important uh, discussion today by uh, able to understand the hard realities facing by developing countries but i believe that the key is how we can address these hard realities with the right technology that can make everything efficient and as uh, affordable as possible and i think with that we able to Uh, make it in a reality by able to bring investors uh, coming into this uh, um, you know this business in this space so that we can really drive the carbon transition to be possible so again thank you very much everyone uh, for the time uh, today uh, i'm sorry that we cannot have time to discuss but looking forward to have a discussion again in the next uh, horasis panel or in other forums that we may meet again thank you very much and have a good day everyone take care thank you so much thank, thank you, you.